basically I'm interested in similarities and differences between you and I felt that you were both good examples of people who've actually gone out and walked your own path in terms of filmmaking. Um, so we, uh, a lot of you are familiar with Jeff, so we'll just briefly go into Jeff's beginning. So I believe you started writing at about 14. Yeah, I mean I was a writer who had nothing to write about. I was always a writer, I always wanted to be a writer. I had nothing to write about and it was only later on after a couple of quite debilitating depressions when I could find no creative outlet that I uh, decided to confront my fears. So that was the beginning of my story. So I wrote all my fears down and systematically confronted them one by one. And that became the beginning of my stories. My ultimate fear was the fear of violent confrontation. So when I reached that fear, I decided to become a nightclub bouncer to kind of to be guinea pig A in my own life. I wanted to see how I, ex how I would cope with people trying to kill me in Coventry, you know. To fight your demons, yeah, you to fight you, your fear. You, you could get into a fight in an empty room in Coventry. Yeah. I, once, I, I once worked on a Christmas, I think some kind of Boxing Day, and there was only two people in the club, and neither of the people knew each other, and they started a fight, and I had to throw them out. Yeah, I've, I've seen this guy get his ear bit off by his girlfriend once when he used to do nightclub photography. So there's the yeah. story. You're there. I, I phoned these two guys out and I said, uh, why, why are you fighting? He says, because he looked at me. I said, well, who else is he going to look at? You're the only other person in the club. So I like, I like the characters. I like the displaced aggression. I, like, I wanted to see how I coped um, under duress with fear. I recognize, the main thing I recognised from working like, as a doorman was that everybody was afraid. Some people just managed it better than others. I realised the, the reason I wasn't an artist was because I was afraid to be an artist. But look at his work. He's not afraid to, to put on stuff that, I don't know where that would fit conventionally, but I really admire it because he's saying, this is what I want to say, I love that. Mm. I love that. It's, it's very brave. It's very structure. Well, it's brave cause, cause you, because you're, you're not watching patterns, you know. It wouldn't fit, it wouldn't fit in a tablet, it wouldn't fit in a cinema, but it's, it's brave. To be an artist, you have to be brave. So me becoming a doorman was the beginning of me becoming an artist. And people don't realise that to be an artist, you have to be massively courageous because you're putting your soul out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. A lot of bouncers take speed. Like, uh, I used to get a ride back because I used to work in Chesterfield, and they'd give me a ride back every night. And then take speed at the beginning of the shift just to kind of kind of feel aggressive because you don't always feel aggressive, is it? Actually, they feel scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind of gave them the extra. A lot of fear. Yeah. My experience of the doors was that everybody was afraid, the violence came from fear, and everything came from that place. I was going to ask you later about characterisation, and that was something I picked up on in, in Bouncer. And the way that you're adding more to the character, and we've got Ray Winston Bounce uh, tapping his foot. I wanted to try and bring some fear. Yeah. fear. Yeah. And uh, those were the, uh, some of the little things I wanted you to ask uh, to talk about, like how you actually build characterisation. Uh, I know now you've moved into, um, uh, I know Romans 12.20 got an award, didn't it, for a long short or something, and you've moved into features. But uh, would you say it's an entirely different skill in a short compared to a feature, and to get that yeah. personality across? I'd say, I'd say shorts are probably more difficult because you've got to get an arc, or you've, got to get, you've got to get an impact, or you've got to get the essence quicker. I think it was Richard mm -hmm. Kipling or yeah. someone. Like yeah. commercially, you know, like... And to make us connect like so quickly, especially with Bouncer, yeah. like very warm characters. Yeah, they're great. And what was that, 12 people. minutes? Yeah, something like that, 10 minutes. So to get that across in that time, with no backstory... But you love the characters, that's the beginning. That's right, yeah. You love the poetry, because there's poetry in that. Yeah. Ray Winston, and also, yeah. Ray Winston can, can call you a cunt and make it sound nice. Exactly. Because to him it's just the, the use of words. Yeah. Um, he's one of the best at saying that. He's brilliant, isn't he? He would yeah. go like to me and go, come here, come here you cunt. Yeah. He would do it. <laughs> it's about, it's about yeah. the, term, the intent of the language. So you could, you could use any, I've seen people use the most benign words and they're very violent and then other people use supposedly 
gratuitous words and there's no violence in it at all. So it's always about intent, isn't it? Yeah, people don't swear as much as they used to, I think. No, I'm good. I don't I swear. Yeah, yeah, everyone's behaving. Nobody, <laughs> nobody swears as much. I remember when I was growing up, people used to swear all the time. Yeah. I've also noticed in Fabrizio's film, you've seen it, have you? Black Biscuit. Yeah. Now that's an entirely different approach to mainstream film, it's unscripted, but um, all the characters in that are likeable, aren't they? I guess so, yeah. I, I think anyone's likeable once you get, you know, I don't think anyone means any harm, do they, deep down that? But what I I'm trust trying, people. I'm just saying it's crucial, really, in capturing people's oh, yeah. attention. Yeah, I mean, once you, get, once you ask someone a few questions, even if they do have, like, even if they've had, like, a bad experience in the past and got, like, a twitch or something like that, you know, that's, doesn't make them bad people, uh, you just have to relate to them in a different sort of way, I think. If they can be bad people, you can still love them, because if you capture truth, you capture essence. It's about, for me, it's just about truth. I don't really care what it is, I just want to, I want to get the essence. And the, you know, there's people build stories around essence, but I'm interested in essence. So I like doing features, but I'm interested in getting smaller as well. And you know, like everything I do is about trying to make an impact. Whether I'm throwing a punch or writing a poem or doing a film, I'm trying to get impact very quickly. Yeah. And that's about accessing the truth. Most people are afraid of the truth. They're afraid of the truth in their own lives. So I'm not trying to make a statement, I'm just, I'm just I'm excited by essence. Because yeah, it's yeah like something. you capture a vibe, like you just, what I do is I don't, I don't write a script. I don't even get to know the people that I'm going to put in a film. I just kind of sit down with them and just hang out with them. And, if they like smoking weed or if they like drinking, something that gets them to relax, whatever it is, and you kind of just capture it. And then if I wanted to film another scene with them, I'd take one of the stories that they told me and I'd reenact it, you know. And so nobody knows really what's happening. And I think it's kind of a good thing because everybody feels that way sometimes, like, oh, if I could go back in time, I would have done this and I would have done that. So in a way, they're kind of like going back and facing certain fears that like you're talking about, you know, violence or violence. I wanted to kind of capture nudity because I, I grew up in Italy and there was a lot of nude beaches in Italy and I feel quite comfortable around it. Like, I started becoming a life model just for a bit, you know, the money was good as well. And, I, you know, I still do it occasionally if I'm offered it. And I just feel, I, I just wonder how it would be if there was like a national day where everybody had to be naked. I think that would kind of bring us close together in a way. You know, once every six months, naked day. Something like that. I, I wish the world was a bit more playful. Mm. So where do, you, um, where do you think the future of film is going? Online. Over here? Online. Seeing what Fabrizio's done, and um, you've um, put your own footprint on the industry as well. What do you think about the future? I, I don't, don't really know, to be honest. I mean, I'm only really interested in finding truth. I'm interested in essence, that's all I'm interested in. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go where that, I'll, I'll kind of leave where that, wherever that is. I don't really mind, I don't, I don't really fit mainstream, uh, mm -hmm. because I talk a lot about very honest stuff, about forgiveness, about the metaphysical power of forgiveness, about, um, about finding the beauty in violent people, because there's a vulnerability. Just about finding the truth and stuff, and most of the people spend most of their life hiding from truth. So I'm interested in that. I, I did have a thing where I wanted, you know, I wanted to get things on at the cinema and on the television, but I don't think that really necessarily fits for me. So I'm interested in it, um, like Steve McQueen says, as a piece of art, whether it's ten minutes or whether it's um, two hours. I'm interested in the arts. I'm not interested in even saying it's a short or a long, because in film there's a lot of snobbery about. Yeah, there is. It should be just about emotions, yeah. And just, you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you capture the emotion, it doesn't matter what it's filmed on or if it's not that professional looking. Like, as I was saying, even mobile phones, you just get anything on mobile phones. I'd just like walk around and yeah. if I saw something that was going off, I'd, I'd just film it, you know. <laughs> That's the best. It's almost like news. It's, it's what's happening in society and you don't see it on the news a lot. You hear about the aftermath, but you don't see what happens before it becomes news and that's kind of like poetry in motion but isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. That's a real filmmaker. Someone like that has, to film, has to film everything. Yeah. They film, yeah. The Shimazan brothers are like that and they have to film everything. Um, and I'm just saying this seems like an inappropriate place for a film festival but it's actually entirely appropriate because my, all of my stories come from these places. 
my, the doors I worked with like this, all of them, um, and the, where I, I grew up in these kind of places. My dad would spend most of his time in these places. My brother died in these places. These places killed my brother. My, my sister's an alcoholic. I, I love these places because of the poetry. I'm really interested in... And the reality. Yeah, the reality of it, yeah. So I'm happy to turn up and talk to anybody, anywhere, um, and just see who I meet and where I go. So he's filming everything, but I'm capturing everything. I'm, you know, life is quite a bit, everything, I'm capturing everything. And everybody ends up being written about somewhere. I love that. Yeah. So it's, but I'm interested in the essence, and I'm not quite sure where that will go. Maybe it will end up um, more online, but it doesn't really matter. I, like everyone's a superstar now, aren't they? Mm. They are. Everyone is a superstar. It, you just have that confidence to think you are. I mean, that's kind of what they've done, isn't it? Mm. You can put anyone in, in the movie, and if you give enough like patience and you explain things right, you'll get you'll get the same exact results. You know, because emotions are emotions. It doesn't matter who is on the screen. I guess it helps better if you if you're better looking, but you know, other than that, it shouldn't really matter that. It's much. interesting as well because it's. Uh... You know, I'm interested in this thing about beauty as well. So, I, you know, if you read the Torah or the Sri Mad Bhagavatam, the Hindu Bible, they talk about beauty is in generosity. Not, not metaphorically, but literally. When you are a generous spirit, you're yeah. connected to abundance. It makes you very beautiful. I'm very beautiful because I love people. I'm very generous. So I like that. I like, I'm interested. I, I, some of the guys I like the most, Big, lumpy, tattooed, bit, you know, like me, covered in scars. But there's a real beauty to them. They're massively generous. I mean, Ray Winston is a lump. Mm -hmm. He's a, you, you won't, you'll struggle to find a more generous man. Because they've got time for you, haven't they? It's amazing. Yeah. Because yeah. he comes from, he comes from, you know, he used to work over, the, he used to live over the, over, I think he used to live over a butcher's in a little oh. tiny flat. Desperate not, desperate not to do telly. Oh. Didn't want to do telly, didn't want to do the soaps. He was broke and said to his wife, he got offered one of the soaps, he said to his wife, do you mind if I don't take it because it's death for me? And his wife said, don't take it. And he ended up, mm. you know, I'm not saying the soaps are wrong, I'm just saying to him, it was, he, he was just interested in doing stuff he loved. That's why he did Bouncer. We sent him Bouncer. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a 10 minute film and we had about 10 grand to make it. And they said, who do you want to start? And I said, Ray Winston. And they, they all, everyone laughed because they said, um, we haven't got enough to pay for Ray's lunch. Who would you really like? I said, I wrote it for Ray. So why don't you send it to him and see what he says. So we got it to him and he loved it. He did it for free. And because we got Ray, we got Paddy Considine and we got a real good cast. So I certainly got Ray Winston and Paddy Considine outside my friend's pub, in a place not dissimilar to this in Coventry, doing my lines, my children watching. Because I've always said to my children, you, you're the reality maker. You create your reality. Don't don't fucking moan about the reality. You're the one that's creating it. Change you. So suddenly we're doing this. I'm wrestling with Ray Winston at two o'clock in the morning in the Coventry nightclub because we do, I'm doing all the choreography. So we're creating this. It's amazing. Yeah, we can yeah. do this. So uh, that uh, uh, second one, the Virgin Rebel one, that was delicious in that interview, and that's kind of what I wanted to get across. Like. He was so negative, wasn't he? I mean, yeah. he had like one or two things, but I kind of like what he's saying about adults and you should stay uh, younger. Is that who that was talking? Yeah, that was so vicious. That yeah, was I love the energy. The energy was great, weren't it? Mm, yeah, yeah, I just like the kids in the background playing, but I wanted to kind of get across as well. Like, he had this almost like, it's like negativity, yeah. like, you know, that I, I didn't like that, but I, I wanted I to like the energy, so, yeah. Yeah, 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 he had loads of energy, but it, it's this thing about it. Yeah. Um, he didn't seem to trust many people. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, it was almost like filth coming out of his mouth a lot of the time. See, I'm interested in filth, I'm interested in capturing that and taking the label off it mm. and saying, why don't you make something better? Because if, the, if this is shit reality, it's, shit, it's only because it's coming to a shit filth. Yeah, yeah, that's so, what he was saying. Because all that, stuff is, all that stuff he was saying is not true, it's true for him mm -hmm. because that's what he sees. Yeah. You know, I was, I was abused when I was 12 and the person that sexually abused me implicitly suggested that the world can't be trusted. Not even the people you love, especially the people you love. So that's the filter my reality came through. So I went out and built this armory and all this wall paint, I'm covered in tattoos, my whole body. Um, and I've built th this ability to kill people. I can kill in 60 languages. These travel through customs because I thought no one could be trusted and I've created nightclubs and pubs. I've created a, a shit reality because I believe that was true. 
and me making films now and writing is me untangling that saying actually that's not true that isn't true we're the reality makers we make the reality so but i love his energy i love the energy of, when you watch the energy of punk it's so um the energy is is so just go out and do it now yeah go out and do it now don't waste time because you know we're not going to be around forever but I mean, change I mean, it, yeah yeah exactly it's so positive you know yeah, I do believe in reincarnation, but I want to make the most of it while I'm here. And uh, just well, don't see any, just don't see any red lights, and just you know, all the way type of thing. Yeah. And it's it's not even a question of money anymore. Like people ask me that, oh, how much did it cost? I mean, the feature cost about five hundred pounds to make. So it's not it shouldn't even be about money anymore. And the fact that you can put a feature film online and everybody in the world can see it, I, I just find that so incredible. Like. I, I, would, I don't think I'd be able to make movies back in like seventies and sixties when it, it, you know, it cost like two hundred grand and stuff like that. But the fact that you can you can just capture reality and it's so much more beautiful than than scripted films and you know that type of thing and just using real people, just having real people there and just hearing what they got to say. Uh, it, does, it doesn't compare with it, with a scripted movie. I think there's room for them all. That, that, that's the point. Because what you do is, is not, doesn't, it doesn't, it's not what I think, do. I think the good thing about you is, is that you've got, uh, you know what you're talking about because mm -hmm. you're writing about things that are close to your heart. Yes. But, I mean, there's a lot of films that are being written about and they're not close to people's hearts. Like, you can see it's been, like, written by, like, probably, like, 14 writers and stuff like that. Most of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but if, if you get, like, something personal, you know, that's kind of what it is. You take something personal and you make it. Whereas Jeff's writing to express reality and you're putting out it's, You can go around it, yeah, it's like a... It's like a figure eight, you can... In a way... But there's no, there's no caveat for me, there's no... Yeah. It doesn't matter, there's room for everybody, that, that's the point, there's room for everybody's expression. Yeah. I don't want to write soaps, but I'm not against soaps. No. I, don't, I don't want to do reality TV, I don't want to do that kind of thing, but, but I'm not against them. I just think, you know, it needs to be a fingerprint, it's got to be individual. Mm. He's very individual, I'm very individual, it, and it's different, but we're both really trying to do the same thing. Yeah. The thing that's quite about Fabrizio's making is that most people are not really looking for to, to capture essence. Most people are looking for, what was someone asked me for the other day, with the script he gave them, it was the worst thing they could have asked me for. Um, the mood? No, it was... Uh, it was um, do you, know when, do you, know when you, do you know when you premiere a picture and you have like a promo, or what do they call it? Trailer. A trailer. Right. We, want, we want trailer moments and we're going, oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. the wrong language. Just wind your neck and let's start again. I don't want to write a trailer moment. I want to write a film that's so fucking amazing that everyone goes around. Maybe I'll fail, but it needs to go around the world. I don't want to write a film for a trailer moment because that's ticking boxes. Yeah, and you get a high out of that. Like, yeah. That's the whole point. Like, that's I, the point. I, I do it. Yeah. I do it because yeah. I have a great experience knowing no, well, I'm not. I, I, I'll go out and I'll meet some person that I've never met before, and you know you're going to get into an adventure and you don't know where it's going to lead. And you know, great, you catch it on film, but I have great experiences while I'm making the films. So, if anything, I just keep making films just for that, like just meeting people and getting into like wacky situations. So, I agree with what you're saying. I'm you can make it for nothing. We made brown paper bag of three and a half grand. We got shortlisted for Cinema Extreme. And they said, the director's not ready. That's what they said. And we said, we'll make it ourselves. And they went, whatever. And we made it for three and a half grand. And Natasha Carlos actually remortgaged her house yeah. to make the film. So we made it for three and a half grand. But at the same time, I wouldn't be afraid of making a, that club was two million. I wouldn't be afraid of making a film for a hundred million. I'm not afraid of money. Mm. It, to me, it's about, it's about looking for essence. Money is just energy. Doesn't actually, act, doesn't actually physically have any existence. Even the gold bullion it represents doesn't exist anymore. So I'm not afraid of making it for nothing. I've made, you know, I didn't get any money for Romans 12, 20. I've got no money for band stuff. So I've got no money for brown paper bag. I'm not interested in it. But, but by the same kind, I'm not afraid of money. You know, I don't want to be afraid. You know, I don't want to be afraid. Of, I don't want to say. Um, you know, if I'm going to make a film with this much money, it's going to be rubbish. It's not necessarily true. It's just, it's just about, you know, if it's going to cost five grand or five hundred pound, that's okay. If it's going to cost, you know, a million, that's okay as well. Depending on, depending on what you want. I mean, that Romans twelve twenty. There's about three hundred thousand pounds worth of work in there, which most of it was free because 
because of serendipity. People like Lisa Gerrard gave us the music because she loved the film and she loved the approach of the directors. You know, um, most of this, the, most of the uh, sound was done by Sony because they just loved the film and loved the message. It was awarded all over America but didn't really get picked up in this country because nobody wants to talk about forgiving a paedophile. Mm. But it's not really about forgiving a paedophile, it's about liberating yourself, yourself and gaining free. autonomy over over something that happened in the past. It's about the power of letting go. Yeah. Well, I don't want to catch like more reality, like that's that's the reality, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. people's reality and we shouldn't hide things like that. No, no, we shouldn't sugarcoat it and give it like a happy ending at the end either. Uh, you know, unless, it, it, unless, unless it has got a happy ending. It's that's the thing for me, it's, you know, it's, um, uh, it's just, it's just yeah. trying to stay, it's trying to it stay. It should be a true ending, though. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. it should be a yeah. true ending. It's what the essence is. I'm interested in essence. And essence can be captured. You might, you might take 90 minutes to find it, and then you find a minute where you go, fucking hell, mm. that's it. You, so, where do you go it. to do your writing? So how, how do you write? Do you retreat? Or um, I, do you write um, as you go along? I, it depends on what I'm doing. When I wrote Fragile, which is a. Which is a it's a the theatrical version of that, another, another angle. Um, it was so uh, potent, it took me 40 years to sit down and do it. It was so potent that I, I actually got um, um, a, a moleskin notepad and a posh pen and I went and sat in, in a pub in Surly Hall and I wrote it in two sessions because I wanted to, on, it, it, this was a feeling, sometimes I write it on mm -hmm. my computer but this one I needed to go and sit somewhere. It wanted to come out, I was afraid of it because it had so much truth in it that really scared me. That's me being really honest. I'm very afraid of some of the stuff I bring out. Mm. I thought, well, if I send this to my agent, my agent's going to fucking sack me. My wife's going to leave me because I'm a fucking sexual deviant, you know. There was, you know uh, everything I'm afraid of, everything I'm ashamed of, everything um, I feel guilty about, all of that rage, I want to get into this play. Well, that's really brave that you, you go out of your way and like, express that's those funny. emotions. Yeah, but it's really tough expressing yourself and giving, giving pieces of way of yourself. That's that's like the biggest obstacle. Like but once you get over that obstacle, like you don't give a shit about what anyone thinks of your work and that type of thing, that's when you can kind of like set it out there and people can get it and yeah. like it and love it. Yeah. You can do something then. You can yeah. I think it can create an expansion in people if you if you touch on truth and you mm. touch on essence. Yeah, it's just a quick barrier that's broken, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Through violence, through nudity, yeah. there's quick yeah. there's quick drugs, there's Real good like, ways to get there. Still afraid of nudity. Nudity, yeah. Shall we ask around the room then? Has anyone got any particular questions that you'd like to ask either of them? How do you feel that you've faced your, your worst sort of thing? Brilliant. Yeah, expanded. Expanded. Because when you, when you go back to the... Because all of those fears are just old core beliefs, conditioning. You know, and once you go in and dismantle them, kind of cognitively, there is an expansion of awareness. So you connect to something bigger. So it's very, it's, um, yeah, expanding is the right word. There's a massive fire. Although after I did Fragile, which was on last year in Belgrade, I had about two weeks of feeling like I was dying because of the residue of all that was coming out. My you know, conditioning is very, very difficult to overcome. Maybe, I don't know whether it's different for the new generation coming through, but for me, getting, getting over the, this condition, this social condition, is very difficult, you know. You're having to kill your parents, you're having to kill your friends, you're having to kill your teachers, you're having to kill those influences, because they will, they will keep you small. In, in the Mahabharata, you just fear it calls this expanding the second self. In other words, taking a hammer to your core beliefs and your fears, Dissolving them, which is what Punk was doing. Punk was, was saying, you know, let's just do whatever we want to do. But it's, I felt liberated and expanded, but I also felt uh, was it, I experienced the death of something, something died. Yeah, you'll, you'll get battered along the way. Yeah. It's not, it's not smooth, you know. When you walk in a room, then when you go and stand and talk to people, and when you physically touch people, they know you're there because you're connected to something bigger. You know, with you, and people will travel across the globe. I've got a course in the moment. People will travel over from Saudi, uh, from Dubai, to you know, to experience essence. So if you if you're not afraid to dismantle your fears, if you're not afraid to look into the void, you know, it's like death. 
Yeah, it does feel like that, yeah. You're connecting internationally as well, aren't you? With your okay. filmmaking. Yeah. The worst bit for me is advertising. I wish I could afford an agent or have an agent do that. Honestly, like, just telling people about your film and... Uh, I'd, I'd rather be creative than doing that, but it's... It's a part of it, like you do have to tell people about it. You can't be arrogant and expect, oh yeah, they'll find it, you know. You, you have to put in the work. Like I, I spent a year filming, a year editing. It's going on two years now of just like telling people about the film and starting work on another one. So it's really strange, but once you get rolling, it's up to you when you want to stop. So you're going to just keep doing it and you know, something else afterwards and something else. So. so where are you both going over the next two years? What can we expect? I've got no idea. No um, idea. Because it's, it's every time I every time I have a plan, I hear this voice in the sky laughing at me, and then it completely changes. At the moment, I'm talking to a lot of people and doing lots of public speaking, talking about uh, you know about personal development, about expression. I don't I don't really see myself as a writer. Writing is just one of the instruments I use for my own absolution, for my own development. You know. I'm interested in um, I'm interested in leaning into all the sharp, sharp edges and, and taking you know taking this challenge, looking at the world, looking at my own potential, see what I can do, um, and creating new realities. If I'm the if I'm the reality maker, I want to prove that. So I'm, I'm constantly destroying old realities, creating new realities. In terms of yourself. Yeah, yeah. So well, in, in literal terms, well, today I'm in today I'm in a pub here. Um, you know, a couple of years ago I was sat opposite Johnny Depp having to move my wife's chair so she couldn't fucking see him. You know, and, and, and next, next week I'm in, next week I'm at Africa. Um, and then in, next, on Monday I'm, I'm, at, uh, I'm just at a country park walking with a guy that's coming over from New Zealand. It's next, surreal, and then you look back on it and you're like... Then the next day I'm walking with a guy who had his, both of his legs and his arm blown off in Afghanistan and tried to kill himself twice and now he's got prosthetics and he's walked around America literally and he, he goes and gets two grand now for every talk he does because yeah. people are interested in the fact that he's, he, he is a miracle and then next week I'm meeting a guy, this is amazing, I'm meeting a guy next week, it's how wonderful my life is but next week I'm, I'm meeting a friend of mine who doesn't mind me saying who's just been told he's dying, he's literally told a month ago he's dying and he's got a couple of months to live, how, the fuck, how do you deal with that? So I'm talking to him at the moment, I feel like I'm talking directly to God because there's no egoic personality there. There's no, all of those, all of those kind of um, conditionings have disappeared and I'm just talking to him about things and he's just giving me pure essence. Yeah. Because he's got nothing to gain, he's got nothing to lose, he's dying. And uh, so I'm meeting him next week, but it's this wonderful experience of being able to talk to somebody and say, what do you, you know, what is it that you see, what are you seeing? What's the purpose? They can't tell you half the time anyway, can they? Because it's such a new thing. He's, he's saying things to me that are really profound, but he's not aware that he's saying them. Profundities, you know. Mm. And I bet he says it simply as well. Very simply, yeah. Because it's, it's just that you can write it on the back of a pebble. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the beauty of it. There's a word in, in Islam called yakin, and it means the truth is undeniably right in front of you. But nobody wants to look at it. Because the truth to most people is a Frankenstein. So you think we should all be artistic then? I just think we should, if we want to, I, don't, I think if people come to me, I just say to them, you have options. You know, success in life is not a It'd option. be great if the whole world was artistic. Yeah. The whole world of artists, yeah. yeah nobody, 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 has to do nine, nobody has to do nine to five. I mean, kind of what would you do? You'd do sports and art. I mean, what is the, you if you didn't have to earn a living and, you know, do like the nine to five and pay your bills. What else is there that brings happiness? You know, I think it'd be a fantastic world. So that expression. Yeah, if everybody was an artist. You can't it's get around money though, can we? Yeah. I can't see how you can get around money. Well, I, I think it'll disappear eventually. It's like the it's Venus it's Project. It's a perception, isn't it? It's a perception. It's not if you like me rent. No, it's still a perception. It doesn't matter. It's still the only thing is that there are some societies on Earth that don't work for Yeah, it's true. Yeah, but we can't change that here. You can go there. But you can. You can, move. Move. you can, but that's a perception. You can change it. You, if you don't believe you can change it, then that's your reality. But for me, I'm a working class kid, a working fat fish till I was 32. And I have changed that. I have changed it. I know how to work with money. I know how to make the money shape. I'm not afraid of money. 
So you can't when you say you can't, it's not true. It, when you say it's not possible, it is possible. No, I'm not saying it. it's not possible to make money. I'm saying it's not possible to live without it. Well, it, that's well, what the, the point is. It doesn't actually exist. It's a perception. Yeah. It's just an exchange of energy, and if we place a value on it, and the value is determined by perception. Yeah. So it's just really about you changing your perception of you. And then if you change your perception of you, other people's perception of you yeah. will change. If everybody burnt the money, if everyone in the world burnt money at the same time and just got rid of it, what are you going to do? That's how... There will be a change at some point if you like Star Trek. Money won't be the, it won't be the main thing people aim for. We can't ignore the fact that the perception is, for most people is very real. And people lose property and they lose, you know, some people lose their minds, some people lose their life over it. But the point is, it's about perception. Maybe you should fight for it. I read, um, I read a really interesting story on the internet about a guy who lives in, I think, a three or four hundred thousand pound house or whatever it was. And this guy was working class and he, he never earned more than minimum wage. Well, somebody said to him, How the heck have you managed to um, put yourself in this house You know that, that we sort of dreamt of and, and we still dream of now? And he just said, It's simple, whatever I am, I just swapped it for something that was worth slightly more. Just continue to grow, yeah. And he just kept swapping things free of charge. You know, just swapping mm -hmm. and then slowly he worked his way on. And he said, I didn't pay for that. Yeah, that's what they do in Cuba. That's what they're favour for a favour, you know. Bigger and bigger favours. See, the thing is, the, the favour for a favour hasn't changed. We still work a bartering system, it's just represented. It's represented by, uh, by a note or by a coin. So it's still a barter system. It's still, money is still just, an, it, it's just the representation of an exchange of energy. And yeah, I'm not saying we should value ourselves based on it, but we cannot live without it, can we? Some days. That's what I'm saying. But that's a perception, that's a perception. People, some people do. I think you can get caught up in that. Politics is a perception, money is a perception. Everything's about perception. But perception is, con is connected to every sense and to every memory. So there's quite a lot to change, but I just think it's. Um, I just think I wouldn't get caught up in in that kind of thinking because it would always keep you limited. For me, if I want to, if I need, you know, a million pounds to make a film, if that's what it's going to cost, then I'll find a way of um, encouraging that money forward, or I'll find a way of making that money. Or if I wanted to live without using that method of exchange, I would just find a way of doing it because it's possible. People, people are doing it. I don't see any limitations. But perception is very, very powerful. Yeah, I mean, it works good in a way. I mean, it, it does keep you humble. That's, I think that's the only good thing about it. It keeps you humble. You don't want to be a spoiled rat either, you know, running around saying, I want that, I want that, I want that. You know, you, you can't do it. You've got to have respect at the same time. You can't expect anarchy. Because otherwise, you know, it'd be out of control. It'd, it'd just be riots everywhere. Do you want to talk a bit about your next film then, Pregnant? Uh, so uh, it's about technology addiction because I think that's probably like one of the big things that, it's a new thing isn't it? I mean I, I remember not having a mobile phone, I remember the internet not existing, I remember playing outside all the time and seeing more people outside. Uh, I kind of got the idea, I went to this commune out in Spain called Sunseed and uh, they just they do some farming in the morning for about four hours and they finish around 11 o'clock and then the rest of the time they just go out and they just go into nature and uh, play with each other and do whatever they want but without no technology. So it's weird, I mean I do it, I know everybody else kind of does it here where they're all constantly checking their phone or you know since advertising the film I've gotten into being on Facebook as well and I'm trying to break that actually, I'm trying to not go on Facebook as much because I don't think it's a good thing it, like be, having like a popularity contest and thinking about likes and stuff like that and I've, I'm, I kind of went out and found people that fit this category like I found a technology junkie, I found a kid who's obsessed with likes on Facebook honestly he, he's in the film he told me he's like I'm not happy with anything unless uh, 3,000 likes and this is how he thinks every single day and he, I just feel He's a bit younger than me, he's about uh, 17, 18, I'm going to be 30 this year. And uh, he just doesn't see anything other than that from day to day. He's like, I'm going to get more lights, get... and he's missing out on a lot. And I've told him this and it's got over his head, but I find it fascinating. Uh, and I met this uh, guy who had uh, cancer, stomach cancer, and uh, 
he was, you know, he, he didn't really bother with technology, good on computers, stuff like that, didn't have good phones. And since he got the cancer and he had the operation, all the, he's inside all the time, so he's, he's prison van inside of his house. So it's just people that fit a new category in life. It's almost like, as I said, a new addiction. I want to explore it and, I don't know, I guess warn people from it. You shouldn't be on a computer all day long. You should have human touch, you know, you've got to have human touch. So yes. we'll see what turns up. Yeah, yeah. So what you, what's happening with you at the moment then, Jeff? You've got something in, uh, you're planning something with Michelle Collins on. Yeah, yeah, yeah she, she uh, I'm doing a film for her. She's asked me to write a film for her. Um, she's really nice, I really like her. I wanted to do a film about a relationship between a 15 year old prostitute and a 50 year old prostitute. One works on the street, one works from home. Um, and uh, a, kind of a, a kind of a journalist comes in and does a little bit of a story about, um, <coughs> about prostitution damaging the local landscape. So I like the idea of, it's mostly about the relationship between these two girls. Because I used to, when I was on the doors and, you know, I used to uh, have a lot of exposure to young prostitutes. And I just loved the energy again, and there was a lot of freedom. They didn't they really express themselves, there was no edit. Their home life was pretty depraved, but there was something really delicious about their energy that I loved. So I wanted to do a story about these girls for um, since I was on the doors about 20 years ago. Do you so, mean like in the way that they're living in the moment? That just, type of person just, lives just, in the moment. Yeah, yeah they're, out, they're outside of. They don't, you know, they've, they've kind of gone beyond what people think of them. They're working outside of the social mores, you know, they're not worried about social norms. Um, there's just a freedom. There's also, there's also a depravity to where they are, to how they live. You know, a lot of the girls I've experienced were very, very damaged girls. But there was, I don't know if it was because of the vulnerability. There was just something, you know, some of the things they would say, some of the things they would do. Just fucking really, you, know, you wouldn't dare think or say. So I wanted to talk to these girls through this film. Um, Michelle wanted to film. The Shimazans really love Michelle, and they wanted to do something because she, you know, to uh, she wanted to do something that stretched her a little bit. So I've done this. This film really stretched because it's a proper, it's a proper, you know, talking about talking about how the trade really is. Not about the drugs or anything, but just about the trade. So I'm doing that one with her. Romans is being made into a feature, so we're currently casting that. Yeah. Um, we're just doing a Kickstarter campaign at the moment. We're starting a Kickstarter campaign for a film we did called, um, what we called it now? Volatile. It was, it was originally called Seven Days. It's based on a story from what's my back when, when I was younger. No, I got it's one of books, isn't it? Yeah, it's more verbal than that. So, and I was very angry, so I got a baseball bat. And I went back in Coventry and got it back. Yeah. So I did a film about that. So that's, um, we're in the process of raising the money for that. And then we did a film called Last Will as well, which is based on a novel I did, which is, um, sorry, I'll sit down. I did a novel uh, called Red Mist, which is, I like the idea of, um, I like the idea of how domestic situations can very quickly become massive. So it's about a guy that gets involved in a domestic dispute between a girl and her estranged boyfriend. He ends up choking this guy out on the cafe floor, but this guy's connected, you know, it's gangsters and all that kind of thing. So it's a kind of a love affair, but it's, I've seen loads of my friends get involved in domestic situations and get, you know, um, get sliced with standing knives or get stabbed or, you know, just because they're trying to help, and sometimes the girl would turn on them as well. So I was interested in taking a situation, a very small situation, in a cafe in Coventry, and then just seeing where it went. So uh, we're in the process of doing that at the moment. Yeah. And okay. all sort of things. Yeah. We've got a couple of uh, film, for the people who've just come in, we've got a couple of filmmakers here. One's a writer, and one's like a, a maverick director. So has anyone got any questions to ask? About uh, filmmaking generally, I don't know what you do, you all do. Oh, we, we, we're uh, some of us are uh, theatre group. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I started, I started out of the theatre, I started at the Royal Court right. in London, my first play. Yeah. Um, I wrote a play, um, 
a one, a one like, uh, just like a one-hander, just one goes the monologue, and it's just about a guy that stands in the nightclub door, and he's telling you about how his life, how his life, and about uh, his, you know, how he sees the world. And that got picked up by the Royal Court, so I started working with their writers group, and uh, mm -hmm. that tour, that tour, that tour, tour bring me back. So is that the influence of your making then, they sort of really experience of doing sort of stage productions that... Yeah, really every time I do theatre, every time I do film, they say this is stage, every time I do stage, they say this is film, and I say, well, why can't it be both? Yeah. And my first short film was basically a ten minute monologue, which we just broke up into scenes, but there's, it's only ten minutes long, but it's got three big monologues, and you, you can't, you're not really supposed to do that in film, but I'm really interested in not being determined by by a camera, just being determined by the characters. And I'm interested in the juxtaposition of taking, say, a bouncer, like Ray Winston plays in that, talking about how he's influenced by Nietzsche. So I like that. I like getting this guy that's supposed to be thick and unintelligent, but he understands Nietzsche, he understands philosophy. Even though he can't escape his predicament, he understands that. So I like, I like messing around with the genres. Because like the guys I worked with when I was in that game, okay, um, some of them weren't articulate, but didn't mean they weren't intelligent. Yeah. You know, and some of them um, uh, were probably monosyllabic, but they were. It didn't. It didn't mean they couldn't communicate. Some of them were just fucking amazing. One guy I worked with was was. If you put him in any other era, he would be able to lead armies. But in the daytime, he worked as a sheet metal worker. I mean, this guy was a, a titan. Was uh, confessions. Like that's what you should capture. Confessions, because those are the things that change people. And I was really glad about what you showed before. You know, where the priest was. I'm Catholic, but I haven't been to confession in a long time. And going to confessions, you do hold back a bit. But it, just the fact that you, you meet people that are willing to like say exactly what they think, you know, and that they're going to hold nothing back. Those are those are the types of films that should, you know, yeah. Yeah, shake you up. And we did. Um, I've got a writers group, a little writing group, and got into that to do. And one of the exercises, because it's part writing, part therapy. Um, although they don't know that, it, to people just come down for writing. But for me, I'm interested in being a catharsis or an atonement. So one of the exercises I've invented is called closure writing. So I get people to to find closure with somebody that they've never had closure with. So mm. Romans is. Romans 12.20 is a closure statement. Fragile is a closure statement. So they have to write something about, they have to write a closure statement to somebody that they can't access because they're dead or because they're not there anymore. Fucking hell, you could hear a pin drop in this room. I mean, people came out with things. People wrote stories that, you know, that, that they've never shared with anybody before. Just the most powerful, I mean, literally stopped the room because it was so powerful. And it was powerful because it, because it needed to be expressed, and it's also because it came from truth. One girl, one girl wrote about the fact that her second husband sexually abused her daughter and told the daughter that it was part of their marriage arrangement that this happened. So the daughter tried to kill herself three times thinking, my mum arranged this. Mm -hmm. She can imagine, this is the first time she's expressed it. She's done it in writing. Just this, so, so powerful, really powerful. So I'm, I, so you know, you can mix it all up. I'm just really interested in truth. I find mm. it, uh, I just find it really attractive. Yeah. Do you think your work has taken you to this point over the years? Do you feel you've changed through it? Yeah, massively. I'm a different mm. person. You know, we talked about reincarnation. I've reincarnated several times. I've experienced several deaths and several rebirths. I live the most wonderful life. I'm still afraid. I still have things that I'm afraid of, but I'm leaning into that all the time. I'm not afraid of being afraid, although some days I'm afraid of being afraid of being afraid. Some days I'm like, yeah, you, you, you can't. You, yeah, you get through one and there's something else. I like sometimes I'm like Mesner when he was camp. Mesner was this iconic um, mountain climber. I mean, he's, you know, it looks like he's actually been cut out of rock. He's an amazing man. He's climbing Nanga Pabat solo without oxygen, and even the Sherpas are saying to him, "This is impossible." But he's interested in doing the impossible. So he's on the mountain, this legend, and he said, I'm too afraid to go up, I'm too afraid to go down, I'm too afraid to stay where I am. At this point, I'm afraid to be alive. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm crying because I can't be away from my wife. I'm not ready to be away from my wife. He said, I'm afraid to be alive. And I'm thinking, fucking hell, that's me. 
The amount of times I've been afraid to be, literally afraid to be alive. So I'm thinking, if this guy, if this guy can be afraid to be alive, it's okay for me. And then, of course, you read, you know, you read Muhammad's life story when he had the revelations on the mountains in Saudi Arabia, and he apparently ran down the hill and hid his wife Khadijah hid him under a coat, and he was so afraid he wanted to kill himself. Jesus was afraid in Gethsemane. Um, Arjuna, when he went into the battle of Guru, etc., was so afraid of the battle, so afraid of winning his kingdom back, he wanted to go and beg for food. So all of the books are telling us that it's okay to be afraid, just don't be afraid of being afraid, because it's an illusion. So for me, writing is really just about confronting my fears um, and changing my cognition, completely changing my cognition. So I, I, I don't see the reality of what I see. So you go up the mountain and you come down, you see a different reality. So the reality I see isn't the reality that most people see. How do you know? Because we talk to people every single day, I get letters from people across the world and they see a completely different reality. Yeah. So I don't like saying, reality. I don't think there's any such reality. thing as reality anymore. Everyone, everybody's got a different reality anyway. Yeah. So what, so what's the, what's the, you know, yellow and blue road, you know, nobody, everyone's walking on different paths, but kind of like comments, you know. Like yeah, that's how I agree, yeah. People are. Just think, if, if, people are, if people are in pain, you can give them options, you know, you can say, you can do something, like you're an alchemist, you can change that. You can turn pain and fear and negativity into something beautiful. That's what I do, that's what I do. I do, you can only really work with yourself, you can encourage other people, but if I've done it, if I've experienced it, and I have, I mean I live and breathe it, if somebody meets me and they're interested in changing, I can't change them, but they, they will be expanded by meeting me, because they can't deny the fact that I've changed, <coughs> from where I was to where I am. So I think your, your expansion creates an expansion in other people, and that's why it's important, I think, what we all do about communicating with people, Talking to people, touching physically, as you yeah, said, touch touch is the best way to do it. Creates actual touching. Touching creates a, an expand, an expanded awareness. So the truth then is undeniably in front of you. If if Jeff Thompson can do these things as a very ordinary person, then I can as well. And how do you think you've changed through your work, Fabrizio? I'm happier, I guess, because I'm doing what I want. That, that's the best thing. You get you get really happy and time goes by really quickly as well. Uh, we were just talking before how once you start doing what you want, a year's gone by, two years gone by, you just feel... Um, you feel out of time, don't you? Yeah, and you start to see time differently as well. Um, you become slower. Not in a bad way, like where you don't want to like crouch down and stuff like that. You, it's like, it's when you take your time a lot more with things. Even if it's just like to get the speed. Yeah, it's consideration, but it, no, it's you not just even that. In your mm, I guess so. I don't know. Um, what, in a polite sort of way? Just considering the moment. You sign that you're yeah. slowing down so you're more considered instead of just rushing through. Mm, that's it. But something comes out of rushing as well, so it's tough to say.